Yeah. Yeah. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, since it seems pretty mellow in here, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, for anyone who hasn't been here before, this is the Tools and Technology Seminar Series. It's a weekly seminar. Uh, we meet every Thursday at this time. Um, basically, just to talk about um, biomedical informatics tools and or technologies um, and or methodologies. A variety of things, either um, in development, um, already developed and just of use to researchers, or um, possibly something that you are developing, or you don't have to be developing it. I am scheduling people for next semester, so if anyone uh, is interested in presenting, please let me know. I'm always looking for speakers. Uh, so today I'm pleased to present Nils Walter from, uh, he's a professor of chemistry, and he's going to talk to us today about. Uh, Computational and bioinformatics tools to analyze single molecule fluorescence data. So is the microphone on? Can you hear? Okay. So uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I've been member of the CCMB uh, group of faculty for a long time, uh, probably the entire time that it has existed or close to that. And um, my own work is mostly in experimental sciences, uh, biophysical chemistry of RNA. Um, but uh, we have used a lot of computational tools. So first of all, a lot of molecular dynamic simulations, looking at um, how molecules evolve in time when you simulate them based on force fields in a, in a computer. Um, and these are actually related to single molecule experimental tools that we use in many ways in terms of the data analysis, the kinetic traps you can get into and so forth. So we developed certain expertise in going into um, these uh, deep, uh, big data of simulations and published many papers on this. But more recently, and this is what I want to focus on today, uh, we have worked on a number of other uh, bioinformatics related tools in order to analyze big data from experiment from single molecule fluorescence observation. And so that's the topic of our talk today. And um, what I want to start out with is to give a background uh, both on RNA and specifically non-coding RNA, why they are important, why they are a hot topic right now. Uh, for those of you who haven't um, been familiar, as familiar um, with this topic. And then um, how single molecule approaches in particular have become really strong tools to look at RNAs and other um, biomolecules in the cell and outside the cell in different forms. And so I want to give you, uh, in order to then illustrate these uh, advantages of single molecule tools as applied to RNA, uh, three different examples for big data that we are generating um, by looking at inside cells here, at so-called microRNAs that are involved in gene regulation. Um, and systems biology can help us as a tool to model those interactions. And we are moving towards um, actually using our single molecule observation inside cells to device such a single molecule systems biology. Uh, we also are using single molecule cluster analysis, a tool that we recently developed. Uh, familiar, I mean, many of you will be familiar with cluster analysis. And we applied it to single molecule fluorescence resonance energy or threat to, uh, um, data in order to really dissect a very complex biomolecular machine, the spliceosome. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. And last but not least, I want to uh, talk about a very exciting new project where we uh, detect single microRNAs inside uh, blood serum uh, from patients. And again, ultimately, we want to multiplex this and, and, and get a lot of data that needs to be analyzed with many bioinformatics tools. So I think my talk will illustrate just how broadly applicable computational tools are in the experimental science, sciences and how important it is to bring those two fields really closely together and integrate them. So first. I will give you a little bit of a spiel on why to care about non-coding RNAs. And this um, you might be familiar with for many of you, the fact that after all these genomes were sequenced, we now understand that if you look at the percent of DNA in a genome that's not coding for protein, uh, that there's a dramatic dependence of uh, the complexity organism on how much is not coding for protein. And so you see that here in bacteria, 10 to 20% of the genome, the 3 million base pairs of E. coli cell or so, is not coding for protein. But most of the majority of, of genetic information is there to make proteins. In single cell eukaryotes, like yeast, uh, it's 30 to 40%. And that very dramatically increases 
as we go to multicellular organisms all the way to humans where we now understand that 98.8% of the human genome is not coding for proteins. Okay? And of course, um, at first there was uh, a surprise, but now we understand that uh, among these, there are many actually non, uh, highly conserved non-coding RNAs. Uh, a brilliant example is that of exist RNA, uh, the, that uh, in all the females in the room, totally silences one of the two X chromosomes, so that no gene expression is occurring anymore. It's only one of the two that's silenced, but it's silenced completely. And how exactly that works, we still don't understand fully, but it's a very long, many thousands of nucleotide, long, highly conserved um, RNA, non-coding RNA, that somehow recruits factors that silence the X chromosome. And, and so, again, I mean, something that, that comes out of all these deep sequencing approaches. Now, uh, that leads us to a picture where I mean, some people call the eukaryotic cell an RNA machine, right? Where um, in some way we've gone viral in just the amount of new discoveries that are made, the number of new people that flow into the RNA field uh, is really staggering and, and, and mind-boggling compared to, I mean, the, the relatively uh, small field that it used to be. And, uh, and that uh, is uh, leading to this viral increase in knowledge about all the roles that RNAs play in the cell, both in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm here. These are just a few functions. Um, and of course, you know that um, when an RNA is being uh, transcribed uh, from a DNA, then you have uh, the spliceosome that sits on a pre-messenger RNA here and splices out. Uh, a piece called the intron from between two exons. And that machinery, the spliceosome, is actually catalyzed by five so-called small nuclear RNAs and SNRNAs that are at the core of catalytic activity. And, uh, and it has also 80 or so proteins and yeast, 200 in us, that uh, basically regulate the machinery. Other examples are once a messenger RNA is exported into the cytoplasm, there are microRNAs that lead to translational repression and eventually degradation of a messenger RNA. And so these processes are inherently very involved in uh, gene regulation, obviously. And, but there are many other functions that are in, uh, constantly newly discovered. Long known coding RNAs, exist RNA is one of those, of course. Um, but there's also DNA repair going on that you have RNAs involved, as, as a, co -worker, a collaborator of us discovered, involved in um, splicing back together, uh, ultimately, um, a double strand break in the DNA. So the RNA is pervasively involved in all uh, processes inside the cell. Right? And, um, and that, I would argue, uh, allows us to see the forest for the trees, uh, finally, because RNA is such a central component that we've ignored for many, many decades. And um, it is this discovery of the pervasive functions of RNA that, in the end, allows us to hopefully recapitulate how the cell, how the human cell works, or eukaryotic cell in general works. Okay. Now, the tools we use to analyze um, RNAs are commensurate with how they operate. Um, if you think about a cell, then inside a cell, there are only very few molecules of the same type. Um, I mean, there's one DNA molecule, or maybe two uh, DNA molecules of the same type, right, two alleles. Um, there are a few hundred RNA molecules, perhaps, maybe a few thousand protein molecules of a particular um, uh, protein in the cell. So the cell num I mean, the numbers of molecules per cell is actually pretty small, which is why modern techniques most of the time take large quantities of cells and, and ultimately extract RNA or other observables and, and averages over all these cells, which loses a lot of information, both spatial as well as uh, individual cell-like behavior. So the tools that we apply, employ, single molecule tools, allow you to get down to the concentrations that matter biologically inside the cell. And there are a few ways in which you can do that. Um, in principle, in all cases, do we need to uh, restrict the volume in which we observe the cells? And we can do that with a number of different, in a number of different ways. So if we can afford uh, ac uh, not having access to the sample from top or bottom, then we would use what is called a prism-based turf microscope, or total internal reflection fluorescence microscope, shown here, where we bring in a laser beam from the top that goes into a prism that you see here, and that couples the light into a quartz light uh, uh, in, at an angle where the light is totally internally reflected at the interface of the quartz side with a solution below. 
that solution is a little microscopic channel that contains our RNA molecules of interest. And as that uh, light is totally internally refracted, it generates this standing uh, light wave called an evanescent field that penetrates into the solution by about 100 nanometers or so, a quarter of the wavelength of light that you can see. And, um, and as a consequence, you illuminate only molecules at the very surface. Anything that's floating about in solution would not be illuminated. And that allows us to zoom in on those molecules and get fluorescence directly from those through a microscope objective here and collect that uh, here in orange and, uh, and analyze it. When we want to work with cells, then uh, conversely, we use a so-called objective type turf microscope, where now the laser beam comes in from the bottom. And that is reflected here by bringing it in off the optical axis of the center axis of the objective in a way that now it's uh, totally internally reflected at the interface <laughs> cover slip with a uh, solution above it. And if you have a cell here that grows on that cover slip, and that's pretty easy to do, then um, only the bottom 100 nanometers or so depth of the cell will be illuminated in this way. So we can look at the basal membrane with which it adheres to the surface. Or instead, we can bring in the laser beam a little bit closer to the optical axis, like so. And in this, what is called near turf or high low microscopy, you get uh, a sheet of light penetrating all the depth of the cell, but going off to the side in this way so that we get very little backscattering and still get a very good signal to noise. Because ultimately, the key here of single molecule observation is to remove any background signal as much as possible and only see the signal from the molecules we are interested in. So to improve the signal to noise that we can see signal. And here, this is um, just an example for how this uh, looks like in a, in a cross-section of a prism-based turf microscope. Again, laser beam calls in, uh, evanescent field is created. And when we have an RNA molecule mobilized to the surface in some way, then we can see uh, the fluorescence that comes, for example, here from a donor fluorophore. And here's the second one here, uh, so-called acceptor fluorophore in this particular case. And we get a FRET signal, which measures the distance between these two fluorophores. And we can get movies, we use cameras, wide field microscopy uses cameras that can look at many spots at the same time and see individual spots um, light up and have different colors depending on whether there's high fret or low fret here, which measures the distance between the flow force. So we can look at conformational changes of an RNA as one example of an application. And we'll come back to that uh, in a little while. But uh, sometimes I still get the question of, and maybe I do get it now, so well, Gary. Right. So as with any technique, right, um, once, I mean, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right, start, once you start looking at something, you already change it, and that blurs it out or changes in some way, right? And, um, and that's true with any technique, really. Um, so the concern with fluorescence, uh, for example, in cell biology is that you actually do induce phototoxic effects because you excite fluorophores. They can produce radical oxygen species, and that can hurt the cell. So there are some techniques, um, and yeah, I mean that, that are used. For example, there's a microscopy stead. For those of you who have seen uh, Eric um, Spetsik talk, I mean maybe I think he mentioned perhaps briefly um, that he shared the Nobel Prize with um, Stefan Hell, and and um, they developed a technique that uses a very high laser intensity, and then you have to really worry about this. Um, for us. The cells typically survive for a relatively long time, much longer than the single fluorophores do. So that for us, typically, an experiment would look like such that we illuminate a cell with that laser only for a half a minute or so, at which point all the fluorophores will probably have bleached, will have gone away. And I'll show you some, some data for this. So that um, we basically end up taking, uh, uh, doing a time lapse experiment. That is, I mean, we to take different time points. We decide, okay, one minute, ten minute, uh, or so later, we look at the the, the system, right? So, um, so then photo bleaching, I mean, or, or uh, phototoxicity is not really an issue because we're only looking at the cell for a short period of time. Where, I mean, that wouldn't. But we are interested in the dynamics on a much shorter time scale than a lifespan of a cell, and therefore we can we can learn something. Um, in in the case of Right here, where we have immobilized molecules on the surface in an isolated fashion, either 
in just pure buffer or in a cell extract or something. Um, of course, there's also the concern, but again, we are typically limited by photo bleaching. And here, I mean, lifetime may be half a minute, a minute, a few minutes or so, but we believe that over that period of time, the relatively low intensity that we use with the evanescent field here is not hurting very much the molecule. But I mean, you have to do controls to make sure that it checks out right. Okay, so then the other question that I want to just ask basically rhetorically uh, is why single molecule observation? What advantage does this have over a standard, uh, say, confocal microscopy that you might do here in the mill or so in a, a microscopy imaging laboratory where you um, just look at a large number of fluorophores at the same time and average over them? Um, and the analogy I like to make uh, is, of course, for the Michigan Stadium, as you can tell, uh, where I mean, now um, you can see that uh, in, a, uh, in a Saturday afternoon, you might see a lot of Michigan fans clad in maize here, maize in blue, uh, and maybe some Ohio State fans over here. But I mean, it's hard to make out details unless you zoom in and see the reverse. And this is probably how they look like now. And not long ago, they looked more like this, right? And the games were always lost. <coughs> and so, but Harbor has changed this, of course. And so, ultimately, we ideally want to actually see um, how individual people behave, get into excited states, change conformation, right? Um, and, um, and over time, there's an evolution of this, right? And only from that can you really gather, uh, ultimately, kind of the rules of the game, kind of understand what's going on on the field, right? By watching all these 114,000 spectators and actually having a real-time information on their uh, state uh, and their mood and so forth, right? And so, so ultimately, that's what uh, single molecule observation allows us. Even transient states that are visited only for a short period of time when somebody does something kind of crazy um, will be visible if you no longer average over everything, right? Where 113,999 don't do the same thing, right? And so, so it's really important to be able to see it in the riddles. And the same is true for molecules because ultimately the cell works by all the crazy um, stochastic events that individual molecules exhibit when they are inside uh, the cell and move about their biologic function. Okay? So that's the premise, the promise of single molecule observation. Now, of course, derived from this was another aspect, which is what is sometimes referred to as nanoscopy, so breaking the diffraction limit towards the nanometer scale of microscopy. And, um, and that, in principle, works as follows, that you have um, an observation of, say, a green and a red fluorophore here in a field of view. And uh, because we have a pixelated camera that detects this, the center pixel will get the most light. And this is just showing this light distribution here, which um, is uh, called a point spread function, in which, I mean, the center pixel gets the most, and then further outlying pixels get less and less light. And the width of this distribution is, of course, about half the wavelength of light, the classical resolution limit of optical microscopy. Um, but um, the fact when you have a single flow for emitter is that the signal um, can report back on this precise position of the flow for that's somewhere in the middle here by simply fitting uh, this point spread function with the Gaussian, two dimensional Gaussian distribution. and recording not just the width, but the center position, which is only defined by how many photons, how good a signal you have, how many photons you collect. And so this is done here. So the color shows the uh, actual signal, the mesh shows the, shows the fit, and the residuals are small. And that gives us a resolution easily in a 10 nanometer regime. Okay, Some people claim even low uh, nanometer or below nanometer. Um, so this breaks the diffraction limit and has led to the advent of all these super resolution microscopy tools that you might have heard about in Eric Bitzig's talk uh, that basically take advantage of having sparse sets of single fluorophores in a field of view that can be turned on and off and then occasionally you see uh, them blinking and determine their position and then over time you uh, accumulate enough location information to reconstruct a high resolution. Um, and of course, that led to the Nova Prize last year in chemistry to Eric Betzig, Stefan Hell, and W.E. Myrna, uh, two Americans. Uh, Eric, of course, with the connection to Ann Arbor, right? He grew up here, uh, came up back here recently with his kid to show him around. Um, and, um, and Stefan Hell, the one German, where I have to always point out that 
his name does not imply what you think it might uh, from the English language, but actually in German uh, translates to bright. Okay, so so very suitable for uh, microscopists and uh, laser spectroscopists, right? I mean, so bright light they are using, right? And so so the three of them shared the Nobel Prize for the development of super resolved fluorescence microscopy based, uh, at least in Eric's and uh, W.E. Murna's case on single molecule observation, just as I showed you on the previous slide. Right? And um, just to kind of make that point, um, these uh, super resolution microscopy tools, and there are a number of different ones, Palm is associated with Eric's name, Storm with Xiaohui Zhuang's name, and so forth, STET or stimulated emission depletion is uh, associated with uh, Stefan Hell. Um, all these uh, bridge a um, regime of length scales here that really matters in biology uh, from, I mean, up to a millimeter down to something like 10 nanometers easily, where you start seeing uh, structures that are on the size range of a protein, right? And so um, of a large protein perhaps, and, and really are important because they are fluorescence tools that look at everything beyond what FRET can do, which is sensitive to distances between 1 and 2 nanometers. Uh, one in 10 nanometers, right? And so, so with that, fluorescence microscopy now can essentially cover the whole biologically relevant length scale here and really compete with electron microscopy in its utility, right? Which, by the way, is also a single molecule tool, of course. Okay, and as, uh, just to drive home the point, um, I'm directing the single molecule analysis real-time or smart center here. This is housed in um, the chemistry building and biophysics that um, offers these tools as open access uh, um, tools for a very low fee, uh, much cheaper than a mill or so. And you get expertise help in implementing them for your specific problems. Okay? So call me if you are interested in using any of these. But what I want to do uh, today is then give you three examples of applications of these types of single molecule and super resolution tools. And the first one is on microRNAs. Um, and microRNAs are one of those classes of non-coding RNAs that are so pervasive in gene regulation. Um, it's now understood that there are about 1,500 different microRNAs encoded in our genome. They make up together about 2% of the whole human genome, more than all the proteins together. This is just one class of non-coding RNAs. And they are transcribed from a microRNA gene in the nucleus uh, processed by a processing machinery called Russia um, here, that then um, get exported uh, in the stem loop structure, uh, where in the cytoplasm uh, they get more trimmed to uh, a mature microRNA, which is about 21, 22 nucleotides long, as two strands still, gets handed over to the so called RNA induced silencing complex or RISC that now becomes activated by removing one of the two strands such that um, this so-called passenger strand uh, is discarded and what remains is a single strand of RNA, is a so-called guide strand that then allows the risk complex to go around in the cell, find a complementary sequence in a messenger RNA. These sequences, these so-called seed sequences, are typically found in uh, three prime untranslated region, three prime UTRs. Once micro risk has recognized and bound to this, Translation of this messenger RNA is inhibited by a mechanism still pretty poorly understood. And then it appears that also uh, there is degradation by recruitment of um, ribonucleases, oftentimes in the context of the so-called processing body or P-body. That's kind of a bag of ribonucleases that start di digesting uh, the ends here, 3 prime and 5 prime ends of the messenger RNA. Right? And so this is kind of um, where we started. And initially, actually, when we started our work, uh, there was a lot of controversy about the different possible mechanisms for gene regulation. Um, there was the thought that the micro risk complex might block translation initiation, might block elongation, might actually recruit proteases that digest the nascent polypeptide chain as it comes out of the ribosome, or conversely, very differently, um, is actually recruiting these ribonucleases, like the CC4 not complex, that then degrades the messenger RNA starting from the 3 prime end. And this was thought to be involving the so called P bodies, the processing bodies. And um, at the time we started this work, there was uh, much controversy because there was a paper by David Patel in Nature that uh, suggested 
that uh, my microRNAs are predominantly act by decreasing the target messenger RNA levels, so degrading them. Um, followed by a review article by Rachel Green at Schultz Hopkins saying that, wait a minute, we don't know um, what the temporal sequence of those things is and, and the relative importance inside the cell because both translational repression and mRNA degradation could play a role. And then she followed up with a research paper that suggested that there's actually a temporal sequence between the two um, around the same time as we came up with our, with our work. Now, um, how did we uh, address this question of what goes on in the cell using our single molecule tools? We developed this technique uh, that I refer to as iSherlock, intracellular single molecule high resolution localization counting, a lot mouthful to indicate that we are Sherlock Holmes is looking inside the cell. And uh, in this case, what we do is we microinject a fluorophore labeled microRNA. MicroRNAs uh, are not easy to label in order to not interfere with the biology, but what we can do is to put a three prime fluorophore on a single fluorophore that is benign and uh, non intrusive. And so we can make those uh, microRNAs in the mature form with a um, guide strand labeled and the passenger strand unlabeled into a cell, in a cultured cell, in a, on a um, cover slip here on our microscope. And uh, then basically watch it diffuse through the cell. But of course, what I should point out is as long as it's um, low in molecular weight, it diffuses very rapidly through the cell. And in our imaging, which uses a camera, which has a certain shutter time, 100 milliseconds typically, um, may easily blur out as long as it's by itself as a mature microRNA diffusing through the cell very rapidly. But the thought was that if it goes into these more complicated, more complex, more larger complexes, um, it would slow down in diffusion. And then we can start observing it. And this is uh, a live cell observation where we do essentially see single fluorophores and then track them over time using the super resolution trick fitting with the point spread function with the Gaussian, as I mentioned, and then follow uh, the particle through the cell in xy position here. Um, conversely, uh, instead of doing this experiment where we look at a particular time, uh, and look at all the um, RNAs in the cell diffusing around until they bleach. Um, in a live cell, we can actually fix the cell. And uh, then everything, of course, stays in the same place. Everything is fixed in space. But then what we can ask is how many microRNAs are together in a spot? And we get these stepwise photo bleaching events that let us count the number of microRNAs that are together in a complex. For example, here, one, two, and three, because each microRNA has one fluorophore that bleaches in an instant. Uh, if there are three of them, you get three steps rather than one. Okay. Does someone have the steps at the tender height? What is it? Oh, yeah. So um, not necessarily because it depends on the optical configuration, whether or not they would appear of the same brightness. And, and so it's rare, actually, that we have, they have exactly the same um, height. And so what we use is uh, whether or not there's a step and above a certain signal to noise. Mm -hmm. If the readout. So you can't use, I mean, in general, you may use, know that, I mean, fluorescence is uh, not uh, inherently calibrated, right? It's a f relative signal. It depends on geometry, where it is in space, and uh, all kinds of things, and amplification. And so, so the signal intensity is not scaling linearly right, um, with um, the through four number, but the number of steps does. Okay, so this is showing that experiment. Inject with a microinjector that touches down on them. Um, our fluorophore labeled RNAs. You see sometimes the cell actually kind of reacting to that little pinch that it gets from the injection. And then uh, we can observe them either by epi illumination, in which case we don't see much, or instead by this high low or near turf microscopy that I mentioned that reduces background dramatically. <coughs> In which case, we can now actually see uh, these cells inability uh, diffused through the cell. Hours after the initial microinjection here, so four hours have elapsed, at which point we see a lot of these particles diffuse about. Okay. And hmm? what is it? Point that out. Yeah, um, so this is one cell, and these are HeLa cells. This is another cell right next to one another. 
And this is one nucleus here, and the other nucleus is over here. And what you see is that oftentimes, depending on the cell, uh, the periplasmic uh, region, I mean, the region around the nucleus, probably the ER, is lighting up with a lot of fluorescence because, fluor I mean, the microRNAs. So you suggest that microRNA have uh, a concentrated nucleus that processes and functions just in the presence of Right. So I'm not going to talk about this, but yeah, we have a paper that we're working on where um, we actually, so these, I mean, just to make that clear, so this bright fluorescence we think is probably attached to the outside. There's some evidence that um, micro risk assembles uh, with target RNAs on the ER, okay? Um, but then um, we can also microinject into the nucleus or the cytoplasm and then look at how quickly it goes into the nucleus or gets out of the nucleus. And it turns out that if we repress transcription, it, uh, a microinjected RNA, microRNA that's in the nucleus, I mean, escapes the micro, uh, the nucleus much faster than when we have transcription going on. So that suggests that there are targets that it binds to. And so, so yes, so there are non-canonical functions of microRNAs in the nucleus. Um, one function has been described a couple of years ago in a Nature paper where. Uh, let seven, one of, my, of the microRNAs we work with also, um, is auto-regulating its own um, uh, pre-microRNA, which is only found in the nucleus, right? And so, uh, because it's processed later. Um, so, yeah, so there are lots of functions uh, in, in the nucleus, presumably. And certainly they bind targets there. When they get exported with the targets or not, we don't know for sure. Okay. So then, um, coming back to uh, cytoplasmic observation and what it does, what microRNAs do in the cytoplasm, this um, shows here uh, an experiment where we did a uh, luciferase uh, assay uh, to make sure that the microRNA plus minus fluorophore attached is still functional in regulating uh, target messenger RNA. And so this is a, a ratiometric measurement of uh, control uh, but, uh, luciferase against the uh, target luciferase. And the bottom line here is, this is a transfection experiment, I should say, also. The bottom line is that um, when we have a matching microRNA and messenger RNA target, you get this repression without fluorophore attached. But if you put the green or the red fluorophore, the Psi3 or Psi5 on there, we, we get almost the same expression level. This depends a little bit on the cell type. But um, we also... Um, did an experiment where we take instead um, green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein, or M cherry here, um, and um, express that in cells, and then uh, target or microinject into these cells uh, a matching uh, microRNA against the red uh, fluorescent protein messenger RNA, and you see that then that diminishes that fluorescence, uh, represses the translation of this messenger RNA while the control is still there. And so this is a quantification. So clearly, neither fluorophore labeling uh, nor microinjection hurt uh, the observation of regu um, gene regulation by microRNAs. Now, the other thing I um, started to alluding to earlier is the fact that, I mean, this is a time next experiment, right? So we inject at a time zero. And the nice thing about injection is we know exactly the moment uh, at which the microRNA has entered the cell. It gives us as in zymologists, as kineticists, a beautiful timeline here. And, uh, and then we can ask, so an hour later, how does it look? <laughs> Up to an hour, uh, you can see that the cell is still very blurry. This is the outline. This is the nucleus here of the cell. And it's still pretty blurry, but two hours uh, after microinjection and then later, you see more punctate matter, no? more, these individual particles uh, that I described in the video. And, uh, and the cells divide normally after 32 hours or so, they've divided. And, uh, and again, show these punctate uh, appearances. And this is again uh, that movie. Um, again, on the left side, one HeLa cell here, another HeLa cell. And then what we can do is uh, particle tracking at super resolution. Um, and that gives us diffusion information. So, for example, here, this microRNA uh, is showing Brownian diffusion, diffusing. Uh, pretty randomly around. Maybe I can restart this. And uh, while this one uh, shows targeted diffusion, where probably the microRNA is bound to a messenger RNA that gets transported along a microtubule here. And you see, I mean, 
again, maybe I'll show that one more time, this uh, trace uh, going in pretty uh, directed motion, uh, unlike random diffusion. And so this is just showing the same data in the two cells, little uh, particles zooming in on those. Uh, here's a particle that's stuck, essentially it's immobile. A particle that shows what we call corralled motion, a particle that has random diffusion, and a particle that you saw so in the last video that has very directed motion. We see that whether we label with green or red fluorophore, same thing. Um, and we can analyze these sort of data by uh, in a very simple way by using a uh, so-called mean square displacement plot, uh, which gives you essentially a measure of how far the particle has gotten um, over a period of time. Okay, and so particle number one here, which is stuck, it's all mobile, shows basically no movement, therefore it has a flat curve. A uh, particle that has um, corralled motion, so stays in an area, but diffuses around a little bit, shows this increase and then leveling off, because at some point the boundaries are reached, can't get out. Um, and then random diffusion shows this linear increase, and then this super diffusion or biased uh, diffusion here shows this um, curvature upwards, because the particle is faster than you would expect from random diffusion, which gives a linear plot in this, uh, in this particular way. So, then we can use these MSD plots um, to fit linear regression lines to them to get a diffusion constant, and then we can plot the diffusion constant as a probability distribution here. And what you see is that there are essentially two different populations here. Uh, and this is, um, we see that regardless of whether we um, look at um, Psi3 green labeled or red labeled uh, microRNA, uh, this is four hours after the microinjection, this is two hours of the microinjection, quite similar. but um, what you can see is also that um, there are two peaks here, in both cases, a slower diffusing peak to the right and a faster diffusing peak to the left. The slower one diffuses, uh, the particles diffuse with about one micrometer squared per second. Here they diffuse with a hundredth of a micrometer squared per second. And um, by analogy, we can, oops, compare this with um, messenger RNAs that can be tracked with a trick that um, Rob Singer introduced uh, where you can put GFP on the 3 prime UTR essentially off a messenger RNA and see it uh, diffuse at a single molecule level and then you get diffusion constants from that and that's very similar to the diffusion constant of this faster diffusing population. Well, if you label these processing bodies, P bodies that I mentioned a couple times, they are diffusing in the slower regime um, where we see the second population of microRNAs. Uh, now the other thing that um, we were able to do is to look Again, at our time cost, right, this is a time next experiment, two hours after microinjection, four and eight hours, there's actually a change in the population. And you see that here if you uh, regard the dashed line as, a, as a, to help the eye, that um, over time, this faster diffusing population shifts to the right uh, and starts disappearing into this gray bar, which is essentially where it's too fast for us to observe and becomes blurry. So we know that we lose these particles from observation because they're gone too quickly and blur out, and both of the peaks really over time move more rapidly, okay, uh, in a time scale of eight hours and so forth. And so I'll come back to that in a little while. Question over here. Yeah. Did you find any extracellular MIRNA? Well, we micro-inject, right? And so um, if the micro-injection is working properly and, I mean, micro, uh, I mean, pipette tip doesn't leak, then there shouldn't be anything on the outside, right? But, um, but it's an interesting question. Because, like releasing from the cell. That's right. So that's a, it's a very interesting question. So um, we see them disappear, okay, over time. Fewer fluorophores over time. We, but we believe that that, or we know now that that relates to degradation of the microRNA. So they disappear, the fluorophores disappear faster from the cell when there's no target there. Okay, when we use a microRNA that doesn't have any target in the cell, then they disappear faster from observation. And that suggests that this has to do with degradation of an unused microRNA. It's known that if there's no target and they're not used, then they're degraded more rapidly. And, uh, and we believe that, I mean, we have pretty strong evidence that this disappearance is, is mostly degradation, where then at some point you have a single fluorophore left and that gets exported uh, from the cell. So we don't know. I mean, it's a very interesting question because we also work on extra <coughs> RNAs now. So I mean, but we haven't, we don't have direct evidence for that. But, mm -hmm. So, Neil, uh -huh. you're very like, directed. 
Uh -huh. Is that something that these things, or it's you mentioned the microtubules? Right. So I should say that we see. No, so so I should say we see that in about five percent or so or less of microRNA. It's a relatively rare behavior, but that tracks with what people see with messenger RNAs. A few percent of a messenger RNA at any given time in a cell is actually uh, transported in a directed fashion uh, of a well, pectin messenger RNA, also garden variety messenger RNA that doesn't have to be in a particular place necessarily, or or. Uh, and maybe has to be, but it's not. I mean, like a neuron where everything has to be. I mean, moved all the way to the synapse for making something. But is there a specific mechanism for microtubule trafficking of these things, or is this something that? Well, so yeah, so so it's thought. Yeah, it's. I mean, so it's. I mean, so this is best understood for messenger RNAs whose proteins function at the synapse, for example, right? Because there you need the transport along the whole axon. And what happens is actually the messenger RNA uh, has a particular signal that gets bound, that stores a ribosome that's already bound there, transport sets in, it goes all the way to the end, and then it makes protein, it gets released, and protein is made only at the site of use, right? And so for a more garden variety, I mean, we have, I mean, we, we use normally um, uh, messenger RNAs um, like either, I mean, for targets. Uh, either HMGA2 with a transcription factor, actually, or uh, elucifrase or something, um, they probably are just captured occasionally by this transport machinery, and a few percent get moved around a little bit, and then uh, the myosin lets go again. I think that's the model. But things that need to be in a particular place, I mean, there is, uh, and, and there's actually evidence or thought, a lot of thought that a few percent of transport, of directed transport, is enough to get on average, things to the places where they need to be. You don't have to transport everything. I mean, again, the exon in, in a neuron is probably different because everything has to go that far a distance. But, but in, uh, in inside the cell, for example, an actin messenger RNA that might want to go to, I mean, I mean, to to the periphery to make cytoskeleton. I mean, that a few percent already starts redistributing in a cell that, that's meaningful for spatial organization of the cell. But that's a whole field in its own, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so the second part of um, iSherlock, as I mentioned earlier, is to fix the cells instead. And then uh, nothing diffuses anymore, no diffusion constant. But we can get information on how many particles are together. And that, again, uses the fact that each microRNA has a single fluorophore. So we can count the number of microRNAs by the number of fluorophores. And so the way this looks like is shown here in this little movie. This is, again, the HeLa cell. Nucleus would be here. And then you see a lot of spots here. And then they disappear over time in kind of a digital fashion. You can see that with some of them still. Maybe this uh, plays over. Let's see. Play over. So they kind of um, are there. And then they either go halfway or they go all the way uh, gone. And so it's kind of like a digital, like um, not like a dimmer, but actually like uh, kind of a, more of a switch. And, um, and again, taking individual particles out of here and then looking at them, the majority actually shows behavior like this one, where, I mean, this is the particle here. It's there, it's there, there. And all of a sudden, it's gone, like a light switch. That would be the signal from it. And it goes all the way to zero very rapidly. The bleaching itself is instantaneous relative to our observation uh, time resolution. Um, but then we also see two steps where it's brighter here and then goes halfway and then um, or so and then even further. And you see that here. You see sometimes three steps, four steps, five steps, up to six steps we can count. And we can then use this information and plot uh, the number of monomers and the number of multimers, which is everything above one, so two, three, four, and so forth. We see um, and how that evolves over a period of hours. And what you see here is that um, the monomers uh, are, you can extrapolate to 100% at time zero, which is where we microinject the microRNA and all by themselves at that moment. But then the monomers start going down to about 50% and then start going back up. And the multimers, conversely, increase from zero all the way to 50%, then go back down. And the going back down is also uh, statistically significant. 
Uh, this is observed here with the microRNA called LED7. It has numerous targets, at least 200 different targets in the HeLa cell that we are using here. When we use CXCR4, which is one of these microRNAs that uh, is an artificial microRNA that doesn't have much of any target in the cell, we don't see that time evolution. Uh, we see mostly monomers, and that stays the same over time. But when we microinject CXCR4 with a target, an official target, now we see again this increase followed by a decrease, suggesting that it's really target dependent. Okay? And the characteristic then is that you have this fast phase over an hour or two uh, of increase in multiple nature, and then uh, a slow over an hour of, uh, of a period of many more hours uh, decrease in the multimers again. And this led us to this model. So, what is it? Sorry, what was that? No, so again, so the way we do the experiment is we wait for 32 hours after microinjection and then take a video that runs a minute. Okay, so in between the cells do not see light. Okay, so it's a time lapse experiment in that sense. So we, that's why there are individual time points here, right? And it's not a continuous, I mean, the photo, yeah, photophysics doesn't work for us to, to see it the whole time. So. <laughs> okay, and um, and so this led us to the model here, where we microinject these fluorophore labeled microRNAs. They they get incorporated sorry, into a micro risk. Micro risk would diffuse, and this has been measured by others, at about 10 to 20 micrometers squared per second. So too fast for our observation. Still on the right side in this gray area that I pointed out um, in the plot. Um, but then. Once uh, uh, associating with the messenger RNA, uh, which is a megadorton large complex, now we start seeing diffusion because it has slowed down enough. And this is this transition from blurriness to specific speckles um, to be seen. Um, and that happens um, over a period with a time constant of about 0 0.8, which we get from this biphasic uh, assembly kinetics uh, kind of information. And then, uh, and at that point, you get more and more multimers because two microRNAs might bind to the same messenger RNA, or multiple microRNAs with their targets might bind to a p-body, the processing body. And then, um, over a longer period of time, there is uh, the second process going on, where the, um, on the one hand, the multimers disappear again, become monomers, but also, uh, so this we believe has, uh, the first part we believe has tr uh, is translational, is associated with translational inhibition. But then over a longer period of time, the multimers become minimers again because presumably the messenger RNA gets degraded and the microRNAs pop back out of the P body. And remember that I pointed out before that um, in all our diffusion constant distribution plot here also, the curve moves to the right over the same time scale of seven hours or so. Um, so suggesting that, yeah, they become not only more monomeric but also faster diffusing, as this model suggests. And, um, and that, we believe, has to do with degradation. Right? And, um, and so ultimately, um, we believe that we have a tool in hand with which we can look at the whole thing. Right? Uh, people in the past have either used biochemical or genetic tools or um, se deep sequencing tools, averaging over many cells and so forth, where they looked only at specific aspects and thought that they were looking at a rope or a tree or a snake or a spear. Well, in fact, like this fable of uh, the blindfolded man and the elephant suggests, we have an elephant in front of us, and you have to look at the whole thing. Right? And so that, um, of course, becomes even better if we can not just look at one color and one type of particle in the cell, but multiple particles. And this we do here with um, by labeling with a green fluorescent protein uh, component here, the P bodies that I mentioned, the processing bodies that also contain, of course, contain a lot of ribonucleases. And then what we can do here is an experiment where we microinject the microRNAs. We observe either the P body, which is diffusing very slowly, um, or then for 10 seconds the microRNA, and and, uh, and then go back to the P body and make sure that it's still in the same position. And then we can map the two colors to one another and see that this microRNA, for example is um, kind of having a brief contact with this P-body and then dissociates. Another one sits on the P-body and then gets lets go. Uh, another one sits on the periphery all the time. Another one here sits in the interior of the P-body. And we even sometimes see a microRNA that sits on the periphery and then gets roped in, kind of like what you expect if the messenger RNA sits on is being degraded from the 3' end and it's being roped in 
um, into the center of the pea body. Now, the other thing we get from single molecule observations, again, further kinetic information. Here, in this case, we can ask, how long does a sorry, microRNA actually sit on a pea body before it dissociates? And we get a time distribution here. Uh, and most particles, uh, most microRNAs sit there for only 1.2 seconds on average, right? But there are some that, in this particular case, sit for the whole 10 seconds of our observation window. So clearly, there's heterogeneity in the observation. We believe that this has to do with a certain glue protein called GW182 in one version um, is sitting actually on the risk complex and glues this more tightly to the P body, right? So you can see heterogeneity um, when you see single particles, right? You can see that every mi microRNA has a little different uh, state in which it is, a different, slightly different um, functional state given the complex it is in. Okay, and that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So that's a processing body that contains a lot of ribonucleases. It's involved in the degradation part. And so this leads us to uh, this idea of a single molecule systems biology. And now I'm coming back to the whole idea of um, bioinformatics, where I mean, we want to, we were starting to do systems biology here with John Dalby Schnell um, to uh, use these single molecule data, which are of course very data rich, to plug into systems biology models to ultimately rebuild the whole behavior um, as indicated, for example, in this model, right? And to really have kinetic rate constants for all these processes here, not just for some, okay? And, uh, and that can be applied to a lot of different things. We work on these DNA damage response RNAs that I mentioned that are involved in repairing double-strand breaks. Uh, we work on HCV and virus, um, viral RNAs now, long cone coding RNAs with Haru Shunayan, and in all, in principle, all kinds of different things. We work uh, with the collaborator in Madison small nuclear RNAs. Okay, so a lot of different applications. Um, and if I, I have a little bit of time, then I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, this cluster analysis that we do with um, single foreign to FRET data to um, figure out uh, splicing. So splicing is one of these processes that I mentioned that uh, involves a big machinery that uh, has to very precisely degrade or, or um, remove a so-called intron from in between two exons to make a messenger RNA that can be translated. And of course, this has to be precise by a single nucleotide uh, position because if you're off by one nucleotide, the reading frame changes and you get the, a garbled protein. And it's known that um, in humans, 60% uh, probably of all single nucleotide polymorphisms that lead to disease have to do with uh, errors in the splicing code, in splicing out the wrong th thing at the wrong time. And so splicing in general uh, works like this. You have um, two chemical steps. The first is so-called branch site adenosine here attacks the so-called 5' splice site here, 5' SS, uh, forms this lariat intermediate. And then this uh, exon 1 here, the upstream exon, comes along, uh, is now free with its 3' hydroxyl and can attack uh, the downstream exon here at the 3' splice site and fuse the two together here and remove the lariat intermediate. Um, as a side product, the intron is removed. And, um, and uh, this is a multi-step process overall. A lot of assembly has to happen in a stepwise fashion. The spliceosome is unusual in that a lot of different components have to assemble each time a new on a pre-messenger RNA to recognize the two splice sites and the branch point. And, and that happens in a very dynamic fashion, which presumably allows for a lot of proofreading and regulation and making sure that you really get the right splice sites uh, by nucleotide precision, precision. And when something is wrong, you can reverse it and try again. Right? And so this is kind of the process that's ideal for our single molecule observation because this is complex, lots of conformational changes involved, uh, lots of components coming in and going out. And we want to understand really to the um, enzymology mechanistic me level of individual um, proteins doing their job, um, how this actually works. And so one of the ways in which we can address this is by working in uh, whole yeast uh, cell extract. So you take yeast, you grind them up, you make a cell extract, and it actually assembles on a pre-messenger RNA and then splices out an intron faithfully. And, um, and so this is known to have these various different steps, commitment complex 2, A complex, B complex, and so forth, up until the very end product here. And the nice thing about yeast is, that you can introduce uh, mutations in certain genes, temporary sensitive mutations, for example, that would knock out certain functions. 
So in this particular case, we just leave out ATP, and then one of the early steps couldn't work because it needs energy. Uh, here we can knock out a particular SN of small nuclear RNA, U6, and that knock, blocks this step, or we can block this step by knocking out a particular protein uh, with a temperature-sensitive mutation that in the cell extract, we heat that up, the cell extract up to the mon permissive temperature, and then the protein denatures, and it no longer has that protein functional. Okay, and so, so you can, you can interrupt this also in defined stages, and this is for something we can use specifically with yeast. And uh, so then again, we do our single moiety fret here of prison based turf, and I alluded to earlier. We excite the donor fluorophore. We record both donor acceptor signals. This is showing here the donor signal, the acceptor signal. And then fret is essentially the ratio of the acceptor divided by donor plus acceptor signals. And you see that fret is low because there's no acceptor signal here at the beginning. And then it goes up as the acceptor picks up, and conversely, the donor loses um, excitation energy because it transfers energy to that acceptor. Okay. And so this is a typical fret time phrase. And we can analyze this in different ways. And so originally what we just did was to uh, do our standard uh, probability distribution here of what fret states we observe. And you can see that that starts averaging over a lot of molecules and then ultimately loses some information because we only know, okay, there's a lot of activity here, the 0.6 fret and, and a lot at very low fret, but it doesn't give us that much information. We can also do uh, what's called a transition density plot shown here that records kind of like a 2D NMR plot um, what fret state initially converts into what final fret state here. So an off diagonal signal would give you the information that uh, very frequently is indicated by the heat map here. We see 0.4 fret converting to 0.2, but then we also see 0.4, sorry, 0.2 go back into 0.4, right? So this is kind of how you read this. And, um, but I mean, when we started doing this, we realized um, that there's a lot of complexity in there. And what we could uh, observe was, for one, that under various different conditions, for example, leaving out the ATP, as I mentioned, or then adding it back in and waiting for a short or long period of time, we have somewhat differences in some slight differences in the transition density plots here. Um, for one, uh, what you can see here is that the transition density plots um, in general are symmetric to the diagonal, which again tells you that this state changes to that state, and that very same state switches back to original state. So this gives rise to pairs of states uh, that are mirror images of one another along the diagonal. So that tells you that uh, what ha what's happening a lot is that pairs of states interconvert like this, and then it switches to another state, and, and that has another partner, and, and so forth. So that tells us that the spliceosome works um, by using thermal motion, a lot of motion between different conformations of the pre-messenger RNA here, that's labeled, um, is basically back and forth motion between pairs of states. So thermal motion itself allows for that. But you can also tell from looking at the traces that this looks very complex. And uh, what we could observe, most, could observe mostly is that when we um, uh, left out ATP, we got a certain number of states. When we added ATP, then it shifted a little bit more to lower fret states, and we waited for a longer period of time at which um, splicing occurs here in this uh, experiment. Um, you see more in the high fret regime, okay? But it's limited in observation. So here comes in cluster analysis, because what we can, were able to do is take these fret traces, fit them with a the so-called hidden Markov model, which uh, essentially idealizes the fret uh, change over time. And, uh, and that shows um, these changes here. And then we can um, translate this into a matrix, a transition probability matrix, that gives you information on what fret states are there, what other states do they convert into, and, um, and ultimately allows us to identify individual molecules by these, what we eventually call the fret similarity matrices and then align them by similarities in their behavior. And this is shown here. So we get a cluster analysis on these matrices. And, um, and then we're able to show that um, certain uh, commonalities appear, that certain subsets of traces have a certain uh, type of behavior. And then we put them back together. These are individual traces now stitched together here uh, as individual traces. You see that we indeed, by clustering them, have found similarities in behavior. So they have a certain 
lifetime in this state, they have a certain lifetime in that state. Occasionally, they have some other state in there, but mostly in this case, two state. Again, one that has a lot of two state behaviors between two other states, right? Mm -hmm. So, how many states do you have in your model? Right, so, um, right, so in the hidden Markov model, we allow up to 10 states, and they are spaced by uh, essentially um, the resolution of our fret. Uh, signal, right? Um, so we uh, have a resolution, we believe, of about 0 0.1. So then we say 0. Point, we bin everything that falls within, uh, close to, uh, between 0, 0.0 and 0, uh, 0.1, we bin that into a bin of 0. 0.5, right? So because we can't, I mean, they seem the same within error, right? And so, so we have 10 different fret states, okay? And then we have uh, had, in the end, I think, um, 17 different clusters dynamic clusters and six static clusters, and it's molecules that had just one state throughout, okay? But that came out from the cluster analysis. And of course, I mean... Yeah, so they give us... But it's more complicated. Not only, I mean, so it turned out that the most unique new observation was actually in one of the static clusters. That at a certain position in the splicing cycle, we visit this very low fret state in a very stable state, and that had to do with particular mutation. Now, uh, maybe talk about this. So, but the idea basically is by clustering it into individual um, common behaviors among these transition uh, probability matrices, we can now uh, say, okay, this is one that has this kind of uh, matrix associated with this cluster, has this matrix on average and com uh, associated with it, and so forth. And then we can say, okay, this, how does this look like in a, in a little trace basis? So this is that kind of trace, this is this kind of trace, this is this kind of trace, this, is this kind of trace, right? And um, eventually, we are able to then um, block the splicing cycle at specific steps by leaving out ATP, leaving out U6S and RNA, leaving out a, a PRP2 protein and so forth, and then identify specific behaviors that accumulate under those conditions, telling us that um, all of these are seen when we allow processing all the way to the end, but when we cut this off, then we accumulate this guy here that then is associated, say, with um, in this state here, the C complex, right? So we can uh, start uh, sampling back uh, information on what fret behavior relates to which of these states on the known splicing cycle. And, um, and, uh, and so, in a way, we are doing bioinformatic purification, right? We've also done biochemical purification when we actually isolate in little complexes and then interrogate them specifically. But this is nice because you can look at everything, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, so do your clusters actually have to match that model? Or do they just tell you the yeah, so, right. So, mm -hmm. they, they are consistent with that model. And we have also done some work that's now under review and revision, whatever. Um, where we have uh, a lot of these actually isolated um, and then can look at them individually and it's very consistent, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't know, I mean, you, you run until, this is probably time, right? Yeah, we should probably wrap up. Yeah. So I'll skip over this just to say that um, clearly um, the kind of uh, big data that we generate experimentally here, either single molecule observation inside the cell, where we want to get diffusion information, information on how things bind to one another for how long, what place in the cell, and so forth. Very data-rich information. So the big data initiative is certainly very interesting to us because we have big data that we need to analyze. Those data need fundamentally models to interpret what these diffusion uh, behaviors tell us about the biological process that we are interested in. So, uh, in the case of uh, microRNAs, right, they uh, assemble with larger and larger complexes. They go uh, and bind to processing bodies that have ribonucleases. They disassemble from them with a certain rate constant. So, you, you can start seeing how a systems biology um, arises from marrying this experimental data rich information with um, computational analysis. And similarly, for the spliceosome, here is an example where uh, cluster analysis has been instrumental in figuring out um, what uh, processes go on along the uh, splicing cycle. And of course, I mean, right now we are labeling 
the substrate, the pre-messenger RNA with donor acceptor. Uh, we are in the process of labeling some of the protein components and look at those differences and so forth, or distances. And so, so you start getting more and more information about this complex enzyme and didn't take, talk about the extracellular RNA uh, detection work as much. But last but not least, um, I want to thank, of course, my uh, all the students and collaborators that have been involved as well as the funding agency. So um, particularly Matt Karshoyer and before him Mario Blanco and Ramya Krishnan, which, uh, who have all now moved on, actually did on splicing work. Um, Sido Pichaya and John Razosovich developed the I. Sherlock work that I talked about, which um, we did in our own lab. And, um, and, but the splicing work was actually in collaboration with Christine Guthrie, John Abelson, and Ellen Lera at UNC, and, and the other, uh, Christine and John, are at uh, UCSF. And then I want to thank you for your attention. More questions? Very nice. So how big is your big data then you collect? Well, so it depends on what you look at, right? So um, the movies themselves are gigabytes, right? I don't know how, 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 whether that counts as very big or not, but I mean, each movie is, is gigabytes, and then we have easily filled up terabyte hard drives and so forth. But then you can, of course, extract the information by doing the particle tracking, so that trims it down a lot. Um, but then, I mean, there's always the question, um, for one, how much do you start throwing away and losing as you kind of pare down the information? Uh, one thing I want to point out, so the mean square displacement curves, for example, they give us diffusion constants, give us just one parameter per particle. But there's actually more information in there. For example, if you have long enough of a trace, then you might see by Bayesian uh, modeling, actually, that uh, in a microRNA might change diffusion behavior from one time unit to another time period to another. So, so there's additional information there that we oftentimes throw away. So, so the more we can mine, the better we can mine it ultimately, the, the more information we will learn about the biological system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for having me.